Welcome to this edition of Great Minds with Michael Medved. And part of what we try to do here, wherever possible, is to take uh, old friends of mine and introduce them as new friends to all of you, especially when uh, the friend is uh, such a remarkable contributor to our civilization, as is Randall Wallace. Uh, Randall Wallace has made some of the most memorable and substantive movies of um, the last several decades, including Braveheart, which he wrote. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, sure that he would be entirely as proud of his screenplay for Pearl Harbor, uh, though the screenplay was fun. Well, we can talk about Pearl Harbor. Uh, we Were Soldiers, a great film that he wrote and directed, and most recently, uh, Secretariat and Heaven is for Real. Uh, welcome back, Randall Wallace. Um, we have been talking a little bit about changes and ups and downs, not only in your life and career, but in Hollywood itself. And one of the things, you've been involved in the movie business for a long time. I've been a commentator in the movie business and somewhat involved for a long time. And people sometimes talk about uh, the ever-living moving business, but it's also the ever-dying movie business. Uh, literally, since the Oh, since the 1940s, the late 1940s, with the advent of television, people were always worried, oh, that's it, movies no more, no one will go watch anymore. And then, of course, when the video revolution came in, and then the DVD revolution. And yes. Though today, there are some people who believe this really is a crisis. This has been a tough summer for the business, uh, a lot of very, very expensive films that haven't done well. Uh, and, and the fact is that so many serious people say they prefer what's offered on television, mm -hmm. particularly with long TV series. Can you think of anything in 2017 in the movie business uh, that has been able to compete with the excitement, say, surrounding Game of Thrones? Because it doesn't exist. Is the movie business in some kind of special crisis right now? I, th I think you're right that the movie business is always in a crisis. Mm -hmm. as, as everything that is, that is living and dying at the same time is... is as we all are. As we all are. Yeah. Um, is being renewed. I think that um, you know, there, there, are, there are passionate and creative people everywhere that for a great deal of time, it seems to me, I mean, great deal, five or six years, there's been a lot more um, open possibility in TV. And I think that has drawn uh, creative people well, into that. There's more being produced. Yes. I mean, the, the amount, the hours and hours and hours of TV programming with 160 different outlets. Right. It's it's different from the very limited. How many how many films does the industry here in America release now? Well, a, f a friend of mine who uh, ran a major studio. I don't say which one or which friend, but he was he was the the top dog. Uh, told me that about fifteen twenty years ago now, that every one of the major studios did twenty five films a year. Uh, they had the budgets for that to make them and, pr and promote them. And now they're down to two or three. So that means that all those people who would have been involved, it, certainly you've got a lot of people working on a film with a $200 million budget, but you still only have one director generally and a few writers, and, and it's not the 50 or 75 writers that might work on 25 films. So you've got a, a, a desert of opportunity, and those people have, have gone toward television. But I think there's real hope. And, and my hope is that the need for the transcendent kind of story, the, the one that, that, that changes people, continues in human beings, and new generations come up that look at what the previous generation, and I mean a generation as in four to five years of changing of generations, um, 
that they look at what their older brothers and sisters were doing and they think it's silly and vacuous and they want something different. I, it, it causes me to, um, to be discouraged sometimes when I think of how few people seem to be trying to make movies that are resonant, that would change your life. I remember going in as a teenager and seeing some films that I would walk out of and say, my life will never be the same because of what I just saw. I was changed by this experience. I, I know people who feel that about your film, Braveheart. And one of them is the vice president of the United States, who, um, did you know he was a huge fan of your film? I've, I've heard rumors, but I'm, I, it, it's, it's almost like something I can't even think about. It's too big. Uh, no, um, uh, Vice President Pence and, and many, many other people are, are tremendous uh, appreciators of, of Braveheart. The whole concept for the movie originated with you. Yes, yeah. How? Um, no relation, first of all. It's about William Wallace. Well, Michael, you know, I, I, the way I look at it is I claim that he's an ancestor and no one can prove that he's not. <laughs> Uh, I, I can't prove that he is, but no one can prove he's not. Um, DNA testing? Uh, well, if we had his DNA, there was a hoax that they had dug up three heads at the base of London Bridge uh, not long ago, but it turned out to be a hoax. Uh, that would have given us some DNA, perhaps. But um, my, um, my father uh, had lost the connection to most of his ancestors because... His father was dead before he was born. When I got married, I, I married a woman who had Latter-day Saint ancestors. And because of that, knew her ancestry everywhere. Well, one of the great resources is their library at Salt Lake City. They have a genealogical records of everybody. Yes. And, yeah, so... So if you said, what are you guys, Irish, Danish, what are they, they could give you the percentages of... Of exactly, and I, all I knew I would, that was that I was Southern. I did not know that almost the, all Southerners have Scots Irish mm. ancestry, particularly people from the Highlands. Right, not so much Tidewater, but Piedmont. Exactly, Scots. Exactly. You, you've read Jim Jim Webb's book, yes. Born Fighting, yes, yeah, which is about the Scots Irish in in America. And we should explain to people. When people say Scots-Irish, it doesn't mean that an Irishman and, and O'Toole met a McTavish somewhere. Right. <laughs> what, what it means is these are Protestant people who were forcibly planted yes. in Northern Ireland. Yes. And where the whole identity of the Scots-Irish was indeed born fighting. Right. And they came to America so early. They were, they were there 100, 150 years before there was a United States. Mm -hmm. So they didn't hyphenate. They weren't Scottish Americans. They, when they hit the soil here, they had been displaced from Scotland decades and decades before, so they just became Americans. And that was why we didn't have a Scottish um, sense about us. Uh, George Washington is supposed to have said in the depths of the Revolutionary War, if it continues to go badly, because he was losing every battle, I'll retreat to the Blue Ridge Mountains and plant my flag among the Scots-Irish who will not submit to tyranny as long as there's a man alive to pull a trigger. And, you know, I, I hear that and I just get, you know, I, I get all yee-haw uh, in that. But I, I didn't know that we were Scottish. And because of the, the poem that uh, Robert Burns wrote, Scots which have with Wallace bled. Scots were here where Wallace bled. Scots wham Bruce is aff and led. Yes. Welcome to your gory bed or uh, on to victory. Yes. And that was the inspiration for the wow. final moments of uh, when Robert the Bruce turns around and, and says, you've bled with Wallace, now bleed with me. See, isn't it, isn't it fascinating? Because I knew the poem because I loved Robert Burns' poetry when I was a kid. I had no idea who William Wallace was. I mean, yes. I knew a little bit about Robert the Bruce, right. who, of course, appears in the film. Yes. But and, well, my, my, my wife said, if you get me pregnant, you have to take me to Europe. <laughs> and I really wanted children, and, and we got <laughs> pregnant, and, uh, and, we, and she was about five months pregnant with our first son, Andrew. Uh, 
And we went to the UK and I wanted to go to Scotland to hunt for my roots. And wow. we walked into Edinburgh Castle and there on the uh, two statues flanking the main entrance were Robert the Bruce and William Wallace. And there's a Wallace. And I said to one of the guards, who is this Wallace? Hmm. And he said, a greatest hero. And I'm elbowing my pregnant wife going, greatest hero, honey, Wallace, greatest hero. Um, and I said to the, the guard, uh, he's, his dates are contemporary with Robert the Bruce. I knew Robert the Bruce was their great king. Um, I said, so does that mean he was an ally in Robert the Bruce's fighting the, the English? And the guard said the magic words. Uh, he said, no one will ever know for sure, which are the words I love to hear. Um, but our legends say that uh, Robert the Bruce may have been one of those who betrayed William Wallace to clear the way for himself to be the king. And that was like hearing that Judas Iscariot and St. Peter had been the same individual. I thought, what if there's something so of the quality, so noble about the way William Wallace lived and died that transformed Robert the Bruce? It was the notion of transformation. And what transformed William Wallace? What, what made him take the step from I'm going to fight them my whole life with every breath of my body to even though I know they, they will likely betray me, I'm going to go put my life in their hands anyway. What was that? And I knew immediately it was an overwhelming story and I wasn't ready to write it. And it was 10 years before I sat down in, in desperation and hope um, to just have a crack at writing that story. And did you know Mel Gibson before this project? No. Because Mel ended up, of course, people should remember, both directing and starring in the film. Yes. And I, I did not write it with him in mind. I'd never written a story uh, with an actor in mind. Uh, and, and, and part of the reason was that Hollywood likes to look at uh, producing something that will look like something they've done before. And that, of course, for any really aspirational actor, what they want is a character they've never played. They want to find those dimensions within themselves that haven't gone expressed. Uh, I wrote the screenplay, gave it to my agent, and, um, and I, I was completely unknown in the entertainment business. And uh, my phone rang one evening, and he said, are you sitting down? And I said, no. And he said, well, you, maybe you should sit down. Uh, Mel Gibson wants to have breakfast with you tomorrow. And Mel was the biggest star on the planet. And I walked around the neighborhood that night and prayed sincerely to God that I would not kiss his ass. Uh, and those were the words I used. I apologize for them. Uh, <laughs> but I thought God was all right with them. Uh -huh. uh, I... I, I meant it. I meant that there, I had been around movie stars and knew this valence that everyone tries to say what they think they want to hear because their, their whims could launch millions of dollars in development. Well, they're magic. They're deities. Yes. And I thought if I treat him that way, I have no value to him. I have no value to me. I have no value to God. So, uh, so that was my prayer, that I would just be honest and straight. And we went in for a meeting, and um, it was at the Four Seasons in Los Angeles, and um, there were about five people around the table, no one else saying anything. And Mel made it very easy to, to talk with him. He, his opening question was, Wallace and Wallace, are you a relative or what? And it broke the ice, and in about five minutes, I was leaning across the table like a tent revivalist, pounding on it, saying, listen, here's how it is. Every movie has a message, a, a, has its true theme, whether it wants to have one or not. And the theme of most movies is the guy with the bluest eyes, the biggest biceps, the, the fattest wallet is the one who prevails and gets the girl. 
This movie says if you're faithful to your heart, even if they cut it out of your chest, you prevail. Now, that's the movie I want my sons to see. That's the movie I want to make. You want to make that movie? I'm your man. You don't want to make that movie. You need to say no. (laughs) And everyone around the table just sort of shrank back. And, And very little was said after that. And Mel kind of looked at me and there just one little look that he kind of held my eyes for a minute and then he looked away. And I thought he's in. And I went and got in my car and I'm driving away and it was my agent on my cell phone going, what did you say? And I started to apologize. And I said, I, 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 no one was talking. Somebody had to say something. And he said, don't apologize. The head of the studio just called and he said he wants to double your deal in the next movie you write. He wants you to direct for me. <laughs> uh, so it took a while then for Mel to say that he wanted to, but he was working his way into the idea that he also wanted to direct and no one had, had, had raised that issue. Um, so, um, and this, this for people to, and now that you know the rest of the story, it, it, uh, best picture of the year. I, I forget how many Oscars? Five. Wow. And best screenplay? It, it did not win. But I, won the, I won the, the Writers Guild Award for best screenplay, but I didn't get the, the Oscar. And Which and, film did? Uh, Usual Suspects. Uh-huh. And, and, <laughs> and the funny thing about that, uh, I say funny, but um, it was such a great experience for me to to have that that expectation. It, Braveheart was the only uh, screenplay whose screenplay was also whose picture was also nominated for best picture and won best picture, and I still didn't get the Oscar, and it it caused me to think. If I allow someone else to grade my paper, whether that's the academy whom I respect or, or anyone, then I have lost my soul in this, that, that I can't make God. And, and, and with every project that I've had since then, there's always a moment when I get on my knees and I have to pray sincerely not to worship the outcome of box office, critical acclaim or rejection and it's a way of worship if you get bad reviews and they destroy you that's that's a way of elevating them to deity as well but that if if i worship that then i have lost my way and it's the most liberating prayer i can ever pray well you prayed the prayer and those have been answered prayers for you another answered prayer was uh your your hymn, Mansions of the Lord, which you wrote, which is the end of your magnificent film, uh, We Were Soldiers, very briefly, because we only have two minutes left, believe it or not, mm. um, if you can describe uh, how you came to actually write the words to that great hymn, which was featured, uh, was used uh, when President... Reagan's body was taken from the memorial service on during his very memorable funeral. Yes. Um, we were in the, the post-production process, and I had a brilliant editor, William Hoy, um, and uh, Bill was, uh, was working on the, the final sequence, and, and I've always let my editors uh, pick the music they want to first put against the film, uh, temp music. And uh, Bill came to me and said, you know, I can't find a a piece of music here. Uh, It feels that it needs to be some kind of requiem. Uh, And we looked for an army traditional requiem hymn, and there was none. The Navy has Eternal Father Strong to Save. Yeah, the Navy hymn. So I turned to my composer, Nick Glennie Smith, and said, look, Nick, you have these beautiful themes in the in the film. Could you shorten one, make it really a, as simple and profound as, say, Amazing Grace, and pull a theme out and, and do that? And he came in the next day with one, and I took a yellow legal pad, and, and I wrote, and the backstory was my father had just passed away mm. about eight days before. 
I had just come back from his yeah. funeral. And um, and I I think it took five minutes, and I and there wasn't a, a word that I, and I I'm a I'm a, a I love to revise. I I've always believed in uh, all good writing is rewriting. This just came out three verses just like that. I read them to to Bill and to Nick, and they said I wouldn't change anything. And um, we went to. Uh, Abbey Road and recorded the music and just the music would make me weep yeah. um, and I thought it was just me and a German composer friend of Nick's was there and the, the orchestra was playing it and in the third verse there's this deep swell of the bass line coming up and the music grows more intense and the German composer stood up in the control room and said mein Gott and I thought it's not just me um, and then we recorded it with the, um, the the Glee Club at West Point, and now they're using it in Army funerals, and it, it chokes me up every time I hear it. Randall Wallace, there's so much more to talk about, um, and maybe at some point in the future we can get a chance to do that. To have the experience of actually hearing uh, a uh, that experience of the West Point Glee Club intoning uh, and performing this great hymn by Randall Wallace, go to our website. Uh, that's mindswithmedved.com. And if you want to facilitate further conversations like this, we urge you to donate what you can. You can find out all about this project and about future projects and future episodes of Minds with Medved to which you can subscribe. So much appreciate your attention your support, and your participation in uh, this endeavor. Thank you. I'm Michael Medved.